Now I mentioned uh, at the beginning that uh, our featured speaker, Lila Connors, would not be able to join us today and that we were hoping to have uh, Haroon Memedinovic as our speaker and we have now uh, confirmed that Haroon is gonna be able to join us. But before we have him join us, we would like to show a brief trailer of the movie Ice on Fire. Ice on Fire is a 2019 climate disruption documentary produced by Tree Media for home box office HBO and directed by Lila Connors and co-produced and narrated by Leonardo DiCaprio. Ice on Fire showcases natural and technological climate change solutions. It's filmed around the globe. The magnificent cinematography by Haroon Memedinovic captures the beauty of the planet worth saving. The Redwood Forest Foundation first became involved in the project because we are practicing on a large scale three of the five natural solutions for drawing down carbon as outlined by the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, the well-known 2018 IPCC report. So now I'd like to introduce Haroon Memedinovic. Uh, Ruffy is very pleased to welcome him. He was on our short list of, of preferred speakers when we set up this event, and as it turns out, he is able to join us today. I met Haroon when he first came to the USAL Forest in 2017 to film Ice on Fire. He is the cinema, cinema, cinematographer and co-producer of the film. Haroon is a regular video and photography contributor to BBC Earth and has contributed photographs and videos to Vogue Italia, National Geographic, the Astronomy Magazine, BBC Travel, Discovery Science, and Blindfold Magazine. His photography work has been featured by various media outlets, including the New York Times, Wired, Time, Forbes, NPR, CNN, the Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post. Haroon is also the author of three books and has been the subject of a TEDx talk. So please join me in welcoming Haroon Memedinovic. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I apologize a little bit here that uh, I'm in a bit of a remote area and uh, video is not probably not going to work for me, so I'll just do it by audio and hopefully I can address some of the questions that Lila would have addressed or issues, uh, but I can also talk a little bit about the production of the, of the film uh, because I uh, had probably spent the most time of anybody on the entire uh, crew as far as shooting, like physical time out there somewhere, um, uh, doing videos and, and time lapses and so on. So, but probably the, except for Lila, the best knowledge about the, what had happened during the production of the film. And I had been basically to every location that's in the film. Uh, I was part of every shoot that's on screen. So, uh, which is atypical for a documentary where usually you're hiring many different shooters they go around and are local to different areas and they do that. So in this film, it was it was very sort of travel heavy film in which uh, me and uh, one or two other people would have been almost at every location. Um, so we can talk a little bit uh, about that um, and we can address a little bit about what uh, Lila was, was going to speak uh, about. Um, and <clears throat> to give you just a bit of a, a background on the film, uh, this was, conceptualized and, and uh, by Leonardo DiCaprio and his company, which is called Appian Way. Uh, they wanted to make a movie that addresses the issues uh, of methane, and this was after the methane uh, gun, class rate gun theory, or whatever it's precisely called, was out. It was a theory that the way that the earth is uh, warming uh, is going to result in this sudden uh, release of methane uh, because of the collapsing permafrost and that is eventually going to uh, uh, amount to a, a, an almost a total extinction. Um, and at that time there was some concern that this theory was going to hold true in a very short term and they wanted to make a movie quickly about it. Uh, since then the science has you know found out a little bit more on this issue and uh, they're less inclined to say that this is uh, something that is going to happen tomorrow or the next year or the next few years. It's still a concern and methane is still our biggest problem potentially in, in the long run because of its um, much more exacerbated impacts on the environment than any other thing that we can put up there. Um, but that, that was sort of the impetus to go do the film 
and the film had changed a little bit as we had worked on it, whereas it was going to be this kind of a, a very sort of scary, uh, you know, we're in a lot of trouble kind of a movie. Uh, we decided as, as we started working on it and finding out about mitigation, especially or sequestration of carbon, that it may have been the best, maybe the best idea to, to kind of do a half and a half and, and have one aspect of the movie be understanding how we've gotten to where we've gotten to and how dire it is. And on the other hand, also um, try to showcase and, and uh, um, show these potential technologies, some that are literally based out in nature, like what you guys are doing, or something like uh, uh, biochar, which we also found up there, or, or some kind of new technologies, which we haven't quite seen uh, on Earth before. Uh, and they've been developed really in the last 10 years, and one of them being uh, direct air capture, for example. Um, so we wanted to kind of do a little bit of both, and that was the decision we made about probably about halfway into making the film. Uh, it became a pretty clear uh, thing to us that we needed to offer solutions or, or at least let people know that there are solutions out there. There's many of them. There are many that we couldn't fit into the film. Um, and one of them happened to be uh, uh, your guys' project, and the way that that came about was as we were doing all this research, Lila had come across um, your project and then it hit her that actually she had contributed to your project. She had actually bought as presents to some people for like New Year's or like Christmas uh, trees actually, like tree planting was a gift and, and it, it was actually with you guys and this was some years ago. So she was very, very happy to find out that uh, not only was this a good deed and, and a lot of people are doing it, but that this was actually an incredibly potent and a powerful project as far as sequestration goes. And in fact, was one of the best ones, one of the best forest-based projects that, that exist on the planet. So she was very excited to have that in the movie. It was something she had been involved with and then didn't even realize how big it was or how effective it was. And so we went up there and we obviously filmed with you guys and, and we knew that this was going to be in a film at the end no matter what and it was going to highlight this one really important area which is the tree planting area which maybe is an obvious one to some people but but I think it can't be understated how important it is especially in certain areas and in certain kinds of trees. Um, and then as we uh, obviously went up there to film that we you know we learned more about biochar which obviously is, is the other big project happening in that area. Um, and we figured, okay, that's a great one also to include in a movie. Um, besides trapping carbon, you know, what it could do for agriculture, the, the potential of it. And now we know that even state of California has a program or, or thinking about uh, starting programs to try to fund some of that for farmers and to, to find ways to educate farmers in, in um, uh, use of biochar and so on. So it's obviously something big and a lot of people are now considering it. And, and as soon as we learned about it, we, we knew we were going to include it in a movie. Um, so that, that was sort of the kind of a very quick uh, overview of, of what had happened here. And um, we had filmed obviously quite a few technologies and it was, uh, there were some tough decisions to make as well in the editing room as to what gets included of all these things. And, and uh, but I was happy that actually we ended up actually including both, both projects that are on your land there uh, in a movie and that a lot of people got to see them and we got a lot of feedback based on that from a lot of people that they were gonna invest in your trees and uh, uh, planting and also in, uh, we've heard from some people about buying biochar, for example, and using it uh, for different reasons, uh, sometimes just in their backyard or whatever it is. Uh, but, but there were quite a few people that have you know, seen it in a movie and responded to that and they liked it. And hopefully that reflects at least in, in some way uh, 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 on your guys' success there and, and uh, you know, fund, funding or whatever it is, you know, uh, we wanted, I think, part of about making this movie was to try to find a way to get people to know about these uh, projects and technologies and, and hopefully get them to invest in it. And uh, Lila and a few others put together a, a, a kind of a sub project to the film, which is Catching Carbon, which is a, a way to donate uh, money to a website, which then gives that money to say you guys or somebody who's doing kelp farms 
to help finance, uh, uh, say, planting of the trees or maybe uh, creating a new uh, uh, kelp farm or, or so something of that sort. One of these sort of climate mitigation uh, technologies or projects which, you know, uh, an individual can contribute to. And if you get enough individuals, we can actually get something uh, happening. You know, I think one of these... Um, uh, for example, kelp farms that we have in the movie, it takes about thirty, forty thousand dollars to start one, which isn't uh, at all impossible to to obviously crowdfund. It's something that's highly possible, and we have somebody on the ground that can get that money and actually start one. So that's one of the things we also wanted to do is not just to have a movie, but to have some actions that followed by as many people as are willing to to do those to contribute some money or contribute their time, maybe volunteer for some of these projects. Um, and we got uh, many, many, many uh, uh, letters, uh, or I should say emails, um, of people talking about that and being engaged, and uh, also an enormous amount of requests to screen the movie from all around the world. I'm going to guess probably in the, in the thousands of requests, you know, five to 10,000 requests for screenings or more at this point. Um, so there's obviously been a, a response. There's been quite a few people that have seen the movie. It's on every airplane, not that people are flying now all that much, but it's on every airplane basically in a world that has video, they can watch our movie. Uh, and that's often where people see it and let us know uh, that have seen it. And um, so yeah, and HBO is really, uh, I think been a, a supportive of the project in a sense of placing it everywhere for free so people don't have to pay for it in some of these platforms and also just releasing it on the internet for free for a while where people were able to see it in large numbers and um and it, you know so in other words there, there's been support of this project that is maybe atypical of the way studios handle documentaries where they often are very really hands-off and once the documentary is out, they're not really involved all that much with it. And they're certainly not giving it away for free, which these guys did so that we were very really happy about that. And in fact, our wish was to just flat out give away the movie for free if possible anywhere we, we can, because the idea is to get people educated on this and get them to understand what's going on in the world. And we, you know, I, I still think vast majority of people don't even understand what carbon is, much less sequestering it or, or even the impacts of of, of burning so much carbon into the atmosphere. Most people just don't understand that. I, I don't think they even remember that out of their uh, high school lessons, if they even remember those. Uh, and it's important to have as much media out there trying to just base level educate people on the problem. I think that's important that I'm glad we did that in the movie, but also just uh, be more hopeful about it. I think if we're doom and gloom, uh, and say that we're all going to die <laughs> because of what's happening in the world, that that's not going to be a particularly effective way to, to use the two years we had to put in to making this movie. I think we had to also say, no, there's definitely ways we can help out and even potentially reverse everything that's happening. But uh, there isn't a whole lot of time to do that uh, before it becomes so uh, costly or complicated or even impossible. Um, but anyway, so that, that took us around the project around the world in quite a few countries over about a two-year period and we were very fortunate to premiere in Cannes which is about as good of a festival premiere as you can hope for um, and that got us a, a, a you know fairly large amount of press and interest and we were very happy about that uh, sometimes with these films especially with difficult subjects like this which aren't the most sexy subjects for an audience um, that often things get released, nobody really gets to see them and they get forgotten very quickly um, that we didn't fall into that trap and that, that we did get a fairly large audience that keeps growing every day. Um, and, um, and that there was, you know, support by the festivals, by the studio and so on. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of in a general sense and uh, about this film. And um, it's for me personally, it was a, um, a long, process of a lot of travel and a lot of difficult locations. We had spent time in the Arctic at really brutal temperatures, which were very difficult to shoot in. Uh, it, they were very uh, punishing on our equipment um, and punishing on our bodies and, uh, and our mental health, probably. Uh, when you're out there for a month and you're out in those kind of temperatures, doesn't matter how ready you are for it, it, it really is exhausting. Um, and I still think very few people can be in those environments and thrive in them and stay in them a long time. For most of us, we're, we're, uh, it wears us down pretty quickly. Uh, and we had, um, 
you know, but by the time it was all said and done in those cold temperatures, we were very tired of, of dealing with it. Uh, but I think what, what pretty much kept everybody going that was part of the movie is that we felt we were working on something worthwhile and that was important for people to see and as crappy as it may be to deal with sort of the production difficulties, uh, which every movie has some form of their own production difficulties. I think for us, it was just the sheer amount of travel and, and you know, the, uh, radical changes of locations. You know, we had, for example, been in Svalbard one week and then two days later, we're down in Costa Rica shooting and we go from minus 60 to like plus 120 uh, temperatures. So, I mean, the equipment was just... Uh, uh, having a lot of trouble dealing with the, with that and we had to constantly attend to it and and take care of it in order to be able to shoot in these conditions you know to go from something that's so cold and freezing to basically a highly humid area um, and either way your equipment suffers and you're physically very exhausted um, but yeah and that was about you know two years off and on at that and and then at last year was a very good year I thought for the movie uh, and I was happy to see everybody from your organization that was able to make it down to Los Angeles for the premiere. You got to see it on a big screen, which is very nice. And um, I'm sure you've heard from people and I'm curious who you've heard from that have seen the movie and, and had, you know, wanted to help you guys or, or, you know, uh, I've been obviously moving on and working on other projects since, uh, but, you know, I do, you know, every so many days get some kind of an ice and fire uh, uh, email or, or somebody calling or commenting. So it's, it's good. There's an engagement and it's kept going now for seven, eight months or more, almost a year, I guess, since the very first screening of the movie. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my sort of a short um, spiel on this. And I know Lila was going to talk a little bit more about certain things that were very specific to her own experience. Um, and I'm sure she'll be able to do that on, on a video once she feels a little better. And you guys can post that. That's as much as I understand was, is going to happen, that she will actually uh, do a little video for you guys and talk about some of those issues. Um, and yeah, that's about it. And if you have any particular questions or things you would like me to address, I can talk, expand upon that and talk a little bit more about it. Thank you, Haroon, for stepping in and, and also for sharing your magnificent uh, cinematography. The, the, uh, the film is really breathtaking and has helped the Redwood Forest Foundation get our message out to a wider population of people. So thank you. Uh, now, please take a few minutes to type your questions for Haroon, and he will be back in a few minutes to answer them. Uh, the first one I can uh, address here is, uh, by Hannah, and she was asking, have you considered making a second part of the movie uh, uh, that's just focusing on solutions, especially the ones that had to be cut out? Um, it's very difficult to get full-blown feature films um, made, and very rarely do you do a documentary and you do a follow-up documentary of this kind. Uh, what, what we will do at some point, hopefully, um, is take some of that footage that we had to cut out and we'll do little short films on particular uh, things like uh, say you're a, a forest project we may do like a little standalone video which is more friendly to social media sharing because obviously with feature films you're not going to post one on your twitter or your facebook um, but you know if we can put together little short films uh, which explains some of these, you know, that are like five to 10 minutes in length or something like that, maybe even a little shorter in certain cases that we are, we are planning to do that. So we won't uh, uh, throw away all that footage uh, or, or leave it somewhere. Uh, there will be some things that get done with that. Uh, and that's hopefully coming in, uh, you know, within this year, we got a little disrupted, obviously, with the, with what's happened with the virus. And a lot of the productions have just kind of come to a, a stop for almost a half a year now and um, once that all picks up and you know once we get everything going we do plan to do some um, cut some shorts and and some will address the the couple of projects you guys have up there and as well as some stuff we didn't even feature in the movie so that is coming but not in the form of a, another feature film in the form of shorts um, is is where you're going to see it um, now let's see 
another question was Karun Tech for your talk. It was great. After filming Ice and Fire Doc, have you made any changes to your video productions to lower your carbon footprint? As a fellow, uh, video, fellow video producer, I'm always looking for ways to lower my environmental impact uh, in locations I film in. Uh, you know, we, um, we're very minimalist as far as our shooting goes. We did most of our shoots in a single day and, and uh, with a very minimal crew. So, um, whereas you have some documentaries where you may have 20, 30 people working at, at any given time on it, uh, on the production, certainly things you see on say like uh, National Geographic fall really under that. Um, where you have large crews and a lot of people flying around and a lot of people driving around to get to locations. Obviously, a carbon footprint there is going to be larger. I think what we've done, the way we've sort of dealt with this to kind of have a, you know, both be positive as far as um, trying to not uh, uh, clutter, you know, the environment with, with and, and stomp all over certain environments with, with 50 people is we keep our uh, crew is very small. Uh, we are very focused on what we are going in to get uh, at any given location. Um, we uh, uh, also just uh, try to minimize the obviously the amount of flying and the amount of driving as much as we possibly can. Um, and because we're more of a kind of a guerrilla unit, even though we worked for HBO and you would think this is a studio movie and you know how many people would have been involved and. Uh, our actual shooting crew was very small. It was, by and large, it was two to three people uh, at these locations, sometimes a little more than that. But uh, we, we keep it very tight, uh, and, and that helps as far as carbon footprint. Um, and uh, th that's what we're going to keep going doing in the future, regardless of what the budget is of the movie. Obviously, when you are trying to save money and your budget might not be high on a certain project, then obviously you want to keep your crew small. Um, as as tight as, as you can. Um, but our belief has always been, even on movies where there's a larger budget, this one certainly had a larger budget than an average documentary. Uh, it's still good not to waste money <laughs> if you can. It's still good to come under budget. It's, it's not just the impact in the environment. It's just sort of shelling out cash isn't exactly what, you know, what, what we celebrate, you know, making these movies is we're not in them to make a ton of money. It's not really an industry where you're making a ton of money anyway. And just spending it, given what the circumstances are in the world, needlessly and uselessly is also something we'd like to avoid. So, you know, I, I, I still think, you know, the way we work is about as minimal as a, as a documentary can be um, as far as impacting the environment. And I think with feature films, with crews of three to 400 people, I think this is a much bigger question and, and an issue uh, because just the sheer amount of people that travel to a location where you have maybe a, sometimes, you know, five, 600 people or a thousand even and, or more in certain films and there the impacts can be much larger. In fact, they can be uh, in some cases very devastating for locations where those movies take place in. And um, I think it is a bigger concern for them. Not that it isn't a concern for us, but I think just given how small our, our crews are, it's, it hasn't been uh, that much of an issue, nor have we ever heard really back from a location where we went and, and had people complain. Uh, we do try to be as respectful as we can uh, about the environment because our environment is our interest and is our passion. And uh, that's what we want to make a lot of movies about. Um, so we're also, as part of that, very respectful to the environment, not just by telling the stories, but also just how we conduct ourselves in it. Well, why don't we uh, conclude there? And uh, if we, if anybody has any other questions, they can continue to send them in, and maybe we can uh, send them along to Haroon for uh, a future um, answer. Thank you, Haroon, and for taking part in our event today. And we look forward to following your career and uh, and seeing your next film projects.